So we're going to get started tonight and let us welcome everyone that's joining us online. We are, I believe, about two and a half months into understanding what it means to break chains. And I cannot stress enough when it comes to deliverance, you are going to always come into opposition. And I want to talk about triggers tonight. Because when it comes to deliverance, certain people will be triggered simply by the notion that they could be influenced in many different forms and fashions through demonic spirits. And typically, there could be triggers when you may imply that certain things in their life could be demonic. That can trigger people because there's this blatant rejection that maybe something in their life is unholy. And we tend to look at demonic infiltration only from the worst of things. So for example, we could agree that maybe hatred in the sense of hatred that is consuming someone is demonic. But we may not be okay to say that something much less than that is demonic. And it's very important to understand that the enemy works far beyond the most grievous things. Little things in our life that we remember doing our whole life does not mean that it may not be demonic. Anything, remember, that begins to compel you, begins to control you, begins to lead you into places where it's consuming you, it begins to rule your emotions. There is a possibility that there are things about our personality that are not from God. And I want to make sure tonight we're going to touch on little things. We're not just going to touch on big things because it's easy to say, no, don't have that, don't have that, don't have that, don't have that, maybe I have this. But realize there's a lot of other parts of our personality that have perhaps been influenced by darkness from the very onset of our childhood. And so I want to pray, and then we're going to get right into it tonight. And I'm going to move quickly. I want us to be done by eight. That's my goal tonight. So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that I would be your vessel, Holy Spirit, tonight. I can do nothing outside of you. So we ask, Father, as I am connected in the root, that I would bear much fruit tonight through me as a vessel. Lord, that people tonight would hear the word of God with authority and power by your spirit. Lord, I'm unable, Lord, to reach hearts, and I'm certainly unable to release individuals from demonic power. But your Holy Spirit can release all demonic power from our lives. So I pray right now that every hold of darkness in our minds, in our body, in our souls would come under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, that nothing would be impossible for you tonight. I pray that you would help us with our unbelief, that you would help us, Lord, navigate this life and that you would begin to continue to set us free from darkness that we previously did not see. Lord, help us not be triggered by things if we don't understand or we don't believe. But Lord, any way and any how, we ask for our continued deliverance. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Are you guys ready? All right, we're going to move quickly tonight. And last week, we talked about confused thinking, obsessions, the inability to cope. And these are not in any particular order. But I want to talk about things like difficulty in making and keeping friends. The Lord has a plan in your life for friendships in your life. And this is one of the strongholds that many people have that they don't always share that would never for a moment think that it could be demonic. But there are people even within every church, our church included, that they desire friendships in their life. They desire godly friendships and they desire making friends, but they cannot. And they often begin to blame it on everybody else. I don't know if you've met anybody like this. They view that everybody else is the problem, 
but they find that they are very socially isolated and they find that they're in a constant state of being hurt and rejected. And I wanna switch over to my notes here, okay. My notes are a little bit different. Give me one second to get there. And so when it comes to this stronghold, we have to understand that there are often spirits behind an individual that has a hard time with friendships. And typically, these types of spirits have to do with rejection. They have to do with a feeling and a spirit of unworthiness. They have to do often with a spirit of loneliness. And there's a reality that often you can interact with somebody for brief moments, but you can almost look into a person sometimes and see that they're lonely. I mean, be honest, has anybody ever felt lonely? Loneliness in of itself is not a spirit. And this is why I preface this meeting tonight, don't be triggered if I share something and you reject it. But I will say, take note of the trigger. Because if you're being triggered, my question is why? And every time I teach a deliverance class, I have people that get triggered at me and get mad. I've had people leave. Because I'll make mention, I've never called anybody out. Have I called anybody out in, this, in any of our meetings? It's never called, well, Josh, when he walked in. I do that kind of stuff. But I've never called anybody out and said, you have this. But sometimes I have people that they're, they're aghast and they think, I can't believe he said this could be demonic. And the question is, is what's triggering in you? I just want to, for those online, for those here, if, it, if the shoe doesn't fit, it's fine. If the shoe fits, perhaps there's something there. Because usually triggers means that something in you is mad. So keep that in mind. But demonic forces use emotional wounds to isolate individuals. Emotional wounds, things that happen. There was an individual that the teacher called him out early in life as a kid, and he felt so embarrassed. And that little incident that the teacher never remembered nor would ever remember, he just said it, the kid was embarrassed, and that drew this kid to adulthood in isolation for two decades because of one instance in a classroom, because of one bullying event, because of one embarrassing moment. And so these types of things can cause lifelong trauma, as we call it. But remember, trauma is spiritual strongholds. It's a nice word. Trauma is a nice word to put icing on demons. There's an emotional, psychological stronghold, but remember where there's darkness, and this is early in our course, everywhere there's darkness, there is potential for demonic activity because light cannot shine in that area. So when emotional wounds have isolated individuals, it makes these individuals difficult for them to experience not only love from friendships, not only support from friendships, and hold on, I wanna say this, this also applies to marriages. Marriages where you have a husband and, life, a husband and wife, but yet that person feels like the person that's even closest to them that they don't have a relationship or friendship with. And often that there are things in that person's life that they need to, to give to God and what, listen, I believe in counseling, but I believe that there is a fine line sometimes between counseling and giving that thing to God and being done with it. There's a time to move on. But the enemy thrives on individuals to isolate. Now, remember, is isolation bad for times and seasons? Of course not. We're talking about, though, when there is a propensity for an individual to constantly isolate, which makes them constantly feel like they're lonely, and it makes them often feel that there's a separation between people 
and vulnerable where they do not have to be vulnerable to other individuals. Because often when there's a problem with friendships, what's happening is the individual is afraid to be vulnerable. And we use things like, well, I'm outgoing or introverted. Are people outgoing or introverted? Absolutely. Remember, you've got to find the line here. But when these types of behaviors begin to change the person, begin to change the family, there's something greater and deeper at work. So the spirit of rejection is often a major factor in making friends. Rejection often convinces individuals that they are, listen, unloved, unworthy, inadequate, leading them to believe that they do not deserve relationships or that others will ultimately do one or two things, hurt them or abandon them. So what happens? They protect themselves. And this spirit will build walls between the individual and potential relationships, preventing healthy social and emotional interaction. There's often a destroying spirit connected to individuals that go through cycles of having friends and then ruining those relationships because the destroying spirit wants to ruin that to put them back into a cycle where that person retreats back by themselves. It's a destroying spirit. Anything that you feel like is good is happening in your life, that spirit comes and destroys it, particularly relationships. So these types of individuals often foster mistrust and insecurity, leaving the person feeling disconnected from others even when surrounded by people. Can I say that again? It fosters mistrust and insecurity in the midst of a relationship, leaving the person feeling disconnected from others even when they're surrounded by people. So these individuals can be around people, but that's not indicative of a relationship that's been built with the people they're surrounded by. They're still isolated. There's still emotions that are working behind the scenes. And remember, emotions are people. Emotions originate from a person. People have emotions. But there are times when you have to understand that the emotions that you may be feeling are not from you. And this is where it gets very difficult to understand the spirit realm. How do we feel an emotion that maybe is not originated from your being? That you've become so accustomed to depression or fear or envy or whatever the emotion is. And there is a time where God says, I want to to remove you from the person that's been using you as a host. Anybody ever, anybody ever heard of a tapeworm? Anybody just get the eebie-jeebies when you think about that? That there's something in you that's living off of you? But that's at the molecular level, right? Tapeworms can get in you and, 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 and they feed off their host. Demons are the same thing, but yet they integrate into your emotional makeup and they first get into the mind and they're able to work with your mind and you realize that you've been doing things that you've claimed as yourself, but the Lord wants to remove that from you. So there's often fear and vulnerability when it comes to these individuals And there's a spiritual stronghold that keeps individuals from opening up to others. Vulnerability is essential for meaningful relationships, is it not? You gotta be vulnerable. But to be vulnerable, you have to trust. And vulnerability is not only meaningful, but the enemy uses past hurts, trauma, or rejection to convince people that opening up will lead to more pain. And the reason individuals don't get close to others is because they're worried that this wound that they have from the past, a failure, a rejection, a breakup, a letdown, a hangup, 
that someone's going to go touch the open wound. I've shared this before, but when my siblings and my oldest daughter, Autumn, when she had bruises, I'm a jerk. I know it. I saw the bruise and I would poke the bruise. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you're not that bad, but I would say, does that hurt? And she's like, stop, right? But remember, the bruise indicates a wound. And a normal poke is not going to hurt, but a poking a bruise will hurt. And the more severe the bruise, the more pain it's going to cause. That's why individuals have often problems with friendships because there is an open wound in the soul. And we often th say things like, well, I don't trust anybody. I've said it. It's not that I don't trust you. I just don't trust anybody. You ever been there? But it often can lead to something in your life where you, you have removed all trust and now you're into a place of dysfunction. God doesn't want you to trust anybody, but he wants you to trust some buddies, some people. So remember, common spiritual strongholds linked to difficulty in making friends is first the spirit of rejection, which tells the person they're unworthy of love. They're unworthy of friendships, making it difficult for them to trust others or invest in relationships. The individual may preemptively withdraw. You ever seen that? Things are going good, and all of a sudden, boom, where are they? they? They're gone. And you hear things like, I just felt, and you, you see this between a man and a woman, but say, I just, I felt like we we're getting too close. Because when you get too close, all of a sudden, vulnerability is required because you can't talk about menial things anymore. Other strongholds would be the spirit of fear particularly of rejection or betrayal, causes the person to build emotional walls and avoid social situations, and they may fear being judged or hurt, leading them to isolate themselves from potential friendships. Now, remember, we haven't talked one thing in th this particular stronghold, which is massive, as it relates to some grievous sin. So the problem, again, to make a full circle, many people, when they start hearing deliverance, they're like, well, I'm not addicted to porn, or I'm, I'm not this or that, or that. And they just discount every other type of work the enemy's doing to destroy your life, to keep you at a place of dysfunction. The other stronghold is, as mentioned before, the spirit of loneliness. Again, that can create a sense of despair, Hopelessness, leading the person to believe that they will never have fulfilling relationships. Brothers and sisters of God, there are so many people in every church like this that they're absolutely starving for love and affection and friendship, but this stronghold keeps them from walking in meaningful relationships. Psalm 68, six says, God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in sun-scorched land. The last stronghold is not a comprehensive list. Remember, none of this is comprehensive, is the spirit of insecurity. Feelings of inadequacy or low self-worth can prevent the person from reaching out or fully engaging in relationships, and they may constantly worry that they are not good enough or fear that others will reject them once they get to know them. That's a big one. If they knew the real me, they would not be friends with me. What is that? That's someone else telling that person what is a lie to keep them from growing close. Ephesians 1.6 says, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Remember, there's principles throughout scripture and remember, I told you several weeks ago, we spent at least two-thirds of our class breaking down scriptures of how spirits worked and the deliverance and the healing that God brings. We are in a new cycle. We're going to spend most of our time unpacking strongholds. So, very quickly, root causes of relationships, individuals that have a difficult time making friends and relationships. Number one, trauma. Trauma. Something happened 
in that person's life. Something as little as a, a little Johnny felt embarrassed in class and he withdrew. Something bigger, sexual trauma. Something bigger, a, some, a family member, a, a husband left the wife. A wife left the husband. Something bigger, a father died early in their life. Every one of these traumas, God can deal with it in an instant. Please hear me, in an instant. He can deal with an instant. It's not that I don't believe in counseling, but at some point you've got to move forward. Pastor Lorene has shared this publicly. Pastor Lorene had to deal with a lot of things in her life as a little girl and in her upbringing. And there was a moment that God released her of all of it in a moment and just said, it's time to move forward. And now when she can look back, it doesn't cause pain. The wound becomes from a wound to a scar. How do you know if you're healed? Because if you touch the wound, it doesn't hurt. If you touch the wound and it still hurts, you're not whole. If you touch the wound and the scar doesn't hurt, you can move on. And if someone brings it up, it doesn't bring flashbacks. It doesn't bring bitterness. It doesn't bring hatred. It doesn't bring withdrawal. The other root causes of individuals that are very difficult to make friendships is unforgiveness. Holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness towards those who have hurt you is very common with individuals that have a hard time with friendships because they will give you a record of every person that wronged them. And they will tell you this is who, what they did, when they did it, and how they did it. Because they're programmed by the Spirit to keep them in perpetual darkness. And then finally, there is often associated with this individual a low self-worth. Feelings of unworthiness that stem from these personal insecurities or past rejection. The individual may feel they are not worthy of having good relationships or that others will not connect with them. And this often leads to a cycle of self-sabotage in relationships as we discussed. Now, our job as believers is when we recognize these individuals, if this is not an area you struggle with, praise God. Remember, we're gonna go through these and you may think, well, maybe that's me or maybe that's so-and-so. I guarantee you, all throughout this, you're gonna be, you, do, you, do you know somebody that this could be? Right, you got somebody in mind, right? And so what, what I challenge you to do is to say, Lord, if there's some darkness here, set me free from it. Because on one side you could say, how dare you say that's demonic? You're not getting, you will not get free. You live, if you want this, continue to live like this. If you want freed, the Lord's gonna begin to work with you on this. But the other thing as believers, when we recognize somebody in this room, somebody in our church, somebody at your work, somebody in your family, you have the ability, if you've overcome this, to bring deliverance to them. And it's not through laying on your hands and ca casting demons out. It's through the love of Christ that he's given you to help them through the process of being free. Now remember, not everybody wants free. So there's gonna be a point sometimes that some of these individuals will weigh you down. And there's a part sometimes you have to realize that maybe you were there for a season. So we have to be careful with that. Now I want to go to a very quick practical application. I'm gonna try to move quicker here. But we're gonna begin tonight, every stronghold, if you weren't here last week, we are going to pray over every stronghold. Every single stronghold tonight, we are gonna pray. I am absolutely confident that tonight at any one of these stronghold checkpoints, at any one of these stronghold checkpoints that God in a moment can do what Satan took two, three, four decades trying to cement in you. That's how fast God can work. And if it's not that fast, Praise God that he can start it tonight, reversing the curse. Do you believe this? I believe this too. 
So I want us to have checkpoints after each one of these strongholds where we are going to, what's up, brother? Can, can we get Nathan one of these, Christy? We are gonna have checkpoints where we're going, I'm going to read, thank you, a deliverance prayer. And if you want it, receive it. Call out, say, thank you, Lord. And we're gonna believe from the healing of past wounds. And let me stop here. Maybe this isn't you, but if you have past wounds, tonight's the night to get rid of it. You have to choose. Do you want to move past the wounds of your past? To ask God to heal emotional wounds, not physical wounds. You know what hurts worse than physical wounds? Emotional wounds. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Emotional wounds from past relationships that may be causing current difficulties in forming and maintaining your current relationships. Every bad relationship that hasn't been dealt with will impact your current relationships. And how do you move past? Well, you start with forgiveness. Forgiveness is certainly layered. There's a moment where you begin forgiving and then there's a moment where you say, I can forgive deeper and deeper and deeper until that wound is completely healed. And it sometimes takes time. And finally, we want to ask tonight to ask the Lord to remove, and this is key, bitterness and mistrust. Bitterness is absolute, not only detriment to you, but it's a detriment to your health. Every bitterness, the root of bitterness, which, for, which, which will become a spirit, will bring infirmity into your body. Bitterness will actually destroy you before it even destroys the other person. And then we're gonna build trust in God. We're gonna recognize that relationships can only be healthy. And remember, whatever type of relationship this is touching on is the relationship that God wants you to focus on. That when we first trust in God's love and acceptance of us, we have to understand that there is a healthy trust and acceptance between God and us. It starts here. It starts here. We cannot try to build healthy acceptance from others if we haven't built healthy acceptance here between God and us. And encourage all of us tonight to root their identity in God. You know why? Because every person you have a relationship with will fail you at some point. And when we hinge our relationship on each other, that person at some point will go through something and will fail you. And we have to understand that. So we need to have identity in God, knowing that we are all loved and accepted by God. Does that sound easy? Sure, but sometimes it's a process. And we have to understand that vulnerability is required. Vulnerability takes overcoming fear. Why are people not vulnerable? Because they're fearful. They're fearful. How are you going to react to what I just told you? And finally, we have to understand that there's going to be sometimes breaking relationship patterns that you're in. Not every friend that you have right now is probably a good friend in your life. You are, you will become like the top three people that you hang out with, including your spouses, for the good or the bad. <laughs> Amen or ouch. Okay, no, don't say anything. <laughs> uh, amen, amen. <laughs> I want to say something about Benny. Um, it's funny. Have you ever noticed when you start hanging out with someone that you take on their, their vernacular, right, for the good or the bad? You ever, any parents ever have their kids come home and you're like, you're talking different, right? And then you realize that that kid and the kid they're hanging out with, they're talking the same thing? Well, I have something for you. There is certainly, remember, this is how my mind works. If you don't like it, reject it. That's just like everything else. If you don't believe it, I don't care. I'm entitled to my own thoughts. If you don't like it, reject it. But it's much deeper than just mimicking. In fact, it's so deep that have you ever realized there are people 
that they don't just say the same things, but they start acting the same way. Most of the time that's spiritual. So there's a spiritual bond that's connected these individuals for the good and for the bad. But we cannot lose our individuality even when we connect with godly people. You're intended to be you. And so remember, the enemy is always about creating cult-like personalities to simply create just imprinted versions. The only imprint you want to have on your life, take the good for the people and your friends, but you want the imprint of Jesus. I want to pray. I want you to just reflect for a moment if any of this pertains to your life. We have a lot to cover, but remember relationships, I should have just said making, keeping friends, but it's relationships down to your spouse. I'm going to pray. And I want you to right now think about if there's any forgiveness and healing that you need to surrender to God tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior and our Deliverer. We come to you with expectation and acknowledgement that you are the source of all love and the source of all of our relationships and that you desire for us to live in community with others, not isolated, not rejected. And we recognize that some of us have struggled to form and maintain healthy friendships. Lord, that some of us need to confess our fear, to confess our rejection and insecurity that may have prevented us from building meaning, meaningful relationships. Not surface level, not skin deep, but tonight we ask for your help and deliverance in this area. Lord, we surrender every hurt and rejection and every accompanying spirit that has latched on to wounds that has latched on to rejection. And the spirit of bitterness begins to be uprooted from your emotions now. The spirit of bitterness that makes you angry. And we repent of that spirit, of that emotion, that bitter spirit that has caused us to be angry. And we forgive the person, the people, the individual that has hurt us. And all resentment that we've had against those individuals that have hurt us in the past. And now, church, choose now to forgive them right now from the deepest place of your heart. Don't hold anything back. Don't hold anything back. You choose to forgive them in the mighty name of Jesus. It's your choice. The power of God is available. It's your choice to forgive. And we ask, almighty God, that you would heal now emotional, deep wounds that have scarred you deep within, that are still open. They're not scarred. They're still open. They're fresh. And they have festered for decades. And you've learned to block them. You've learned to hide them. You've learned to make sure that nobody gets into that spot because that's a place of vulnerability for you. Choose now that the Lord would come in and bring the balm of Gilead to those wounds. Now, in the authority, in the mighty name of Jesus, we renounce and break the spirit of rejection. Say that right now. I break the spirit of rejection. And we command every spirit of abandonment and insecurity to leave in the name of Jesus. You have no place in our hearts. You have no place in our minds. You have no place in our relationships. And we declare 
that we are accepted. Say that right now. I'm accepted and loved by my heavenly Father. And Lord, we reject the lies of the enemy that says you're unworthy, that says you're not lovable. And we break its tie now. And we rebuke the spirit of fear that's kept these people, that's kept us from being vulnerable. Every spirit that has kept you from even being vulnerable to your spouse, we call it broken. And we cast out the fear of rejection. We cast out the spirit of betrayal. We cast out every hurt in Jesus' name. The God of our ancestors who sent his son full of power and authority has the ability to bring healing and deliverance tonight. Not tomorrow, tonight. And Lord, we trust that you are our protector. Listen, he will protect you. He is your refuge. And we don't need fear forming in our relationships because you are with us. Your word says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And Father, I ask that you'd fill us with your love. And we pray divine connections of godly friendships in our life that it's broken tonight. That something breaks tonight. That that power is losing its grip. Every stronghold that's kept you, that's held you, that's kept you in a place of not having godly relationships, that it loses its power tonight in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we declare freedom from the spirit of rejection. Freedom from fear. Freedom from insecurity. And we walk in the fullness of of your love and peace in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said, well, I'm sure we'll get to 30 tonight. Because <laughs> we're doing such a good job getting there now. That is probably not going to happen. <laughs> but praise God. Amen. Anybody, anybody feel the power of God? Okay, amen. Amen. Let's keep walking in it. You ready for the next one? All right. So we're going into patterns of failure. Patterns in your life, you must always observe patterns. Failure is God's plan to teach. Every one of us is going to fail. Failure is a teacher. Failure is a better teacher than success. But when your life is full of continual failure, something's wrong. Remember, discretion is needed. Discernment is needed. None of these things in of itself is demonic. It's when they all become patterns, patterns of failure, repeated failure in important areas of your life. School, work, sports, personal goals, relationships, despite significant effort, you get in life what you put into it. And so if you're not putting in anything and there's failure, we're not talking about that. I mean, that may be another area, but we're talking about when you put in significant effort and you still see failure throughout your life. I have been in counsel with people in deliverance where their life is summarized by failure. Every relationship, every job, every endeavor. And when these patterns of failure begin to manifest as consistent setbacks and the inability to progress or feeling like success is just out of reach, even with hard work and commitment, the person experiences obstacles, rejections, breakdowns, that seem inexplicable. Give me one second. I just want to turn this down for a moment. When these things become inexplicable, but yet they continue to happen. 
And this pattern often leads to feelings. Let's face it, no one likes failing, but every one of us has gone through it. But when your life is defined by failure, that is discouraging. And when your life is defined by failure and you're discouraged and you begin to lose hope to move on, who's at the root of this? Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when we see this pattern that leads to this constant defeat, constant hopelessness, causing the person to believe that success is never obtainable, we see that there could very likely be a demonic root. Signs of patterns of failure include stagnation in career or academics. When you become born again, you are now infused by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please listen to me. If you don't think you're very smart, but the Holy Spirit comes in you, that means that he is really smart in you. And any area of inadequacy, God is going to be able to make up those areas of inadequacy. You remember when God asked Moses to go before, to go before Pharaoh? And Moses gave an, an excuse. He had a speech impediment. God was not worried one time about his speech impediment. Every one of us is going to have some area in our life where we feel either disqualified or we feel impaired. Usually the places where you feel impaired may be the areas that God is gonna push you into. I said it last week. The moment you said, I can do it, it's probably not God because if you can do it, you don't need him. But when you see that there is this constant unexplained failure, a constant broken relationships, because let's face it, the greatest successes in life is not the money you earn, it's the people that are built around you. It's the family that's built around you. But you see individuals that may experience frequent relationship breakdowns, whether it be romantic, friendships, or family relationships, despite efforts to resolve conflicts and maintain connections. And this goes back into the friendships we talked about when failure, that destroying spirit, is constantly just destroying. When you see repeated financial struggles, look, we're not talking about your everyday, even those that live paycheck to paycheck. Look, life's expensive. But we're talking about catastrophic failures that are always happening. Despite careful planning or working hard, the person may face ongoing financial struggles, unexpected expenses, job losses that prevent them from achieving some type of stability in life. There might be something behind this. Because we often, as believers, especially those that are determined, if you don't have money, you think, well, I gotta work harder. If you're at a loss, you think, well, maybe I, I need to do this more. And what happens is this repetitious, you're doing all this in your own strength, saying, Lord, I need you and I give you the control of my finances in this instance. When you have someone that has the inability to achieve personal goals, and it could be widespread, remember, I'm just giving some options, whether it be weight loss, personal development, or other goals, the person may constantly fall short, feeling not only unmotivated, but experiencing setbacks that prevent the person from progressing. Now, quick side note. Personally, and Josh and I together were together today, I am anti-institutional education. I'm not saying it may be for you, but as a whole, I'm anti-institutional education. Meaning that college is a huge ripoff for at least 80% of students. It's there to absolutely bankrupt mom and dad and bankrupt a student. And you'll never convince me otherwise. We're talking about students are coming out of school with excess of $100,000 to $200,000 of debt. And if you look at the studies, you go to college to eventually make more money in your life. Because if someone says, well, it's a passion. I said, okay, if you can make as much money not working 
than working, which one would you pick? And they said, well, I wouldn't work. I'm like, okay, then it's not that much of a passion, right? Because you're going to do what you were called to do, even if you didn't have to do it. That's where real passion is, at least to some level. So we have to understand that when it comes to any area in your life where you have this absolute pattern of, fa of failure, there is something demonic working against you that you need to get the victory from. You need to break this stronghold in your life. You have a blessing upon your life, an Abrahamic blessing, a, a promise, a covenant that's been made that your hands are blessed. Everybody look at your hands. Your hands are blessed. Say it. My hands are blessed. And that is the understanding that when you put your hand to something, that it's blessed. That that thing, that job, that career, that family, that purpose, that mission, it's better off when your hands are in it. And then there's other people where their hands are cursed. That the moment they came along, be honest, some of you have lived some, some years. Have you ever found that the moment, you almost make this correlation, that the moment that person came into that, everything went bad. God does nothing but through blessing and cursing. So you have to understand if there's a curse upon your life, there is something demonic working behind it to take your blessing. You were made to bless. Thank you. Thank you. You Thank you for, so much for seeing that. Thank you, Christy. Appreciate you. You were made to be a blessing upon everything that God commissions you to do. And there's one or two thoughts. Remember, you are not called to do everything. I believe that I could do way more than I was actually capable of doing. I mean, I dream big. Anybody here dream big when you're younger? But one of the greatest stories I like to share for any of the athletes in here does anybody here remember when Michael Jordan started playing baseball? Michael Jordan, in my opinion, and I'm not probably the best person to ask, but I believe he was probably or is the best basketball player ever, right? At least up there. I'm looking at the, he is, okay. Number one. Well, when Michael Jordan retired the first time, for whatever reason, he went to go play Major League Baseball. But when he played, and it was a short stint, and when he went to play Major League Baseball, he realized he couldn't keep up with those guys. I mean, how long did he play? A couple years? He did okay. But he was the GOAT as a basketball player. And he was okay as a baseball player. And he eventually went back to the, to the NBA where he was in his element. That is the focus for especially some of those that are still dreaming and building. Do not spend your time doing things where you can't be the greatest at what God's called you to be. Because ultimately, you're probably wasting your time. When I was younger, I used to believe I could do this and this and this and this and this and this. And then I realized that time is the greatest commodity that we have. And I developed what I call the time pie. In a perfect world, you have eight hours of sleeping, you have eight hours of work in a perfect world, and you have eight hours of free time. And everything you give your time to, it has to take time from something else. It might be your family, it might be your sleep. Anybody ever feel like they don't get enough sleep? Because maybe something else is being taken from. And so when you realize that, you realize that God's not called you to everything. God's not called you to every ministry here in the church. God's not called you, look, I want people to show up. But God's not called you to attend every service that we have. Just being honest with you, right? There's sometimes your first ministry is your family. Your family is your first ministry. Now, there should be a decision in your family that as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. So this doesn't give you a blanket exemption to not show up. But I'm saying that, hey, we do this month, 
We got a Sunday afternoon altar. We got another altar ministry next week. We've got a healing service. We've got a, on Halloween, we're going to do a prayer and worship intercession. You might not be able to make all those and that's okay. Does that make sense? But there are going to be things in your life that God highlights and focuses that you need to be at the best. Why does this, why does this matter? You are not called to be a failure at what God puts your hand to do. You are a blessing to what you contribute to. Amen? And that's important because you have to understand the enemy will bring discouragement and tell you that you're the problem. The enemy will tell you that you're a failure. Be honest. Has anybody ever heard that in their mind that you're a failure? See, the enemy will tell you things that you're not making a difference. The enemy will tell you that the people don't need you. The enemy will tell you that you're just, you're just an inconvenience to everyone. And these are demonic blockages, forces that actively work to not only block a person's success, but they block you from having successes in life where God has gifted you to succeed. And there's one or two things. You may be trying to push a door open that you were never intended to walk through or you are under some type of demonic attack and God wants you to walk through that door, but you need to break this curse on your life. This stuff's real. And this can manifest through unseen spiritual hindrances that delay or completely derail your progress regardless of your effort and skill. There are people that seem that when they put their hand to something, it just works. And they're walking in either a demonic anointing, I'm talking about if it's a worldly thing, or they're walking in the anointing of God. And this is what's bizarre. Do you realize that even people that are not saved, when they walk in their gifting, they will succeed? They're simply using their gifting for themselves, but they're still gonna succeed. That's why I told you about Michael Jordan. Find the area in your life, ask God to highlight it, and begin to spend your time in the area that God has gifted you with. You say, I don't have any giftings. Well, there's your first lie. There's the first lie. It's not true. But this person goes through cycles of defeat, demonic oppression that constantly, simply puts him on another path of defeat. Common spiritual strongholds that are linked to this are again, and we're gonna see some common denominators the spirit of rejection is often a common denominator in a lot of areas. The enemy wants to bring rejection at some point early in life. Something big that ruins their confidence. The spirit of poverty is an absolute wicked spirit. I brought up two weeks ago about the pimps in the pulpit, about false prosperity gospel ministers that don't really teach God. I believe God is prosperous in all he does. It's when you pervert the message of the gospel. Prosperity is having more than enough. That's where it starts. You have more than enough to give. Isn't that great? When God's giving you an abundance to give, that may not mean that you're gonna be a millionaire. I hope you are, but you know what? That very thought that some people want to be wealthy could be the very thing that God's keeping them from being wealthy because remember, money will buy the most wicked imaginations that you have in your heart. Anybody see what's happening with P. Diddy all over the news? But the spirit of poverty works to keep individuals in lack and struggle regardless of their efforts to manage money or secure stable income. Principle, it's hard work to be poor and it's hard work to be stable or what you may call wealthy. You pick which hard work you want. Hard work is part of what God's called us to do. Working hard is satisfying. Not working is not satisfying. Working hard is satisfying. Is it hard? That's why it's called hard work. That's why it's called work, but it's satisfying. 
But poverty is something that we have to understand that we as believers need to break from our life and the life of others. And if God has blessed you, be a giver. Find the people that are impoverished. Find the people that are enslaved to poverty that are close to you and help them get out of it. But remember, have you ever seen generations of generations that are stuck in poverty? You begin to see patterns. Failure, impoverished, impoverished, impoverished. Now flip that around. Usually what you ha have when you see people in wealth, and I'm even talking middle class, you have a generation of success. Success, success, success. The spirit of poverty can be broken. Just like that. Something clicks, something's released. Often we see that the stronghold behind understanding about um, patterns of failure is again the spirit of fear. Failure can often be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you remember when the Israelites, the, the 12 went and spied out the land and they said, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And so they became. You will become your greatest fear. And that's terrifying. You will succumb and become to your greatest fear. People will prophesy and then find and then say, I knew it would happen. That's because you keep prophesying it. You keep prophesying it. The enemy uses fear to paralyze individuals, making them hesitate, hesitant to take risk or pursue opportunities which ultimately leads to more failure. And lastly, these generational curses, as I mentioned before. Some of the root causes is often there's unrepentant sin. Not always. Remember, sometimes you won't ever discover the root cause. Move on, break it, move, move forward. Often, again, there's generational issues, patterns of failure that can be passed down through generational curses or sins that have not been addressed. These can manifest in various areas, causing family-wide patterns maybe of divorce, family-wide patterns of poverty, family-wide patterns of addiction, family-wide patterns of chronic illness. And there's often spiritual attacks in individuals in areas where God intended them to succeed. But spiritual warfare is a constant battle, and without recognizing the influence of the enemy, I individuals can remain trapped in cycles of defeat without the understanding. I had an individual that I loved the other day, and he said, do you really believe that there's spiritual warfare? I said, absolutely. Well, I don't know if there's, you know, I, I just think that people need to get back to the basics and understanding. Well, I, I hate to tell you this, but your Old Testament, our Old Testament, and I shared this previous weeks, every battle you see the Israelites fight they had to fight persons in this reality with swords and spears and arrows. Anybody read Joshua? First and second Kings, all the battles, all the blood, all the deaths. You and I have the luxury, if you call it that, fighting the same giants that are on this earth in the spirit. They've not gone away. They've simply reincarnated, if you want to call it that, right, for lack of a better term, in the spiritual realm. Our fight is spiritual. Their fight was physical. Isn't that the whole theme of the Old and New Testament? The tabernacle was physical. The altar, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, physical, 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 only to reveal that all of these things were types and shadows of the real spiritual fights that we're in. You can deny all day long that these don't exist and that's fine, but you'll never get the victory over them. So we have to understand when it comes to biblical foundations, God's will for his people is success. Tell your neighbor that. God's will is for you to succeed. His, his promises according to a covenant that God made through Abraham is to bless those who follow his commands. Isn't that great that God wants to bless you? To, that you walk in obedience. 
And when there are repeated failures, we have to understand that is not God's plan for you. Will you fail at times? Certainly. Are you destined to a life of failure? No way, reject it. Do you want reject? Do you want failure for your kids? God doesn't want failure for you. So I want to go and move into prayer. Does anybody tonight know anybody in your life that has patterns of failure? If this is not for you in this time of prayer, focus this towards that person, okay? You guys ready? I like to do some music. It just feels better. This is Ruach. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer. And we thank you that the victory that you have secured for us on the cross, we declare that you have given us the power to overcome every stronghold in life. And Lord, we recognize that we have been caught perhaps in patterns of failure, maybe not for you, but maybe for your loved one, maybe for someone that's in your home, maybe for someone that's in your life, patterns of failure in various areas of life. And we thank you now that deliverance is at hand. And we repent of any sins that we know. And we confess the sins that we know. We confess the sins that we do not know. But nonetheless, we confess our sins that may have opened up doors through ancestors, fathers, mothers, down through three generations. Lord, patterns and failures of defeat and stagnation. And we declare that through the blood of Jesus Christ that we are redeemed from every curse of the law. And we cancel every legal right that the enemy has had over our life and, and mothers and fathers and over our family. You can break it off your children right now. And over our family, bankruptcies, constant failure in decisions, in employment, constant failures in endeavors, constant failures in whatever they put their hand to, that there's a failure. We break that spirit that has come to bring failure and we break it apart off our life and our loved ones. And we bind and rebuke the spirit of failure, the spirit of poverty, the spirit of stagnation. Brothers and sisters, these are real warfare happening in your life. You may not understand why, you may not understand it ever, but just understand that the enemy has chosen to attack you and your family line in this area and get over it. And in the name of Jesus, we command every spirit of failure, defeat, every spirit of hopelessness and rejection to leave now in the mighty name of Jesus. You have no power over my future. Say that now. You have no power over my future. Say this, you have no power over my success. And you have no power over my relationships. And you have no power over my finances. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we declare that we are set free from the power, set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you now that you release your blessing over our lives in every area that we've experienced failure and defeat. We stand on the promise of your word and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail and you shall only go up and not down. 
And if we obey the commandments of the Lord our God, we pray, Father, for the strength to obey his commands. And we choose to walk in obedience to your commands, trusting that the Lord will lead us into success and fruitfulness when we're connected to the vine. We don't have to strive. We don't have to beg. We simply need to be connected to the vine, the life. And we declare tonight that freedom is here to break cycles of defeat. We'll no longer be held back by the past, by generational curses, by the enemy's lies, that we are a new creation in Christ. So Father, renew our mind and transform our thinking that we walk in alignment with your truth, that we are more than a conqueror through Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone said, amen, 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 amen. Well, how many have we gone through? Two? We're not, we're, we're doing well. We're doing terrible. We're doing terrible. It's all my fault. Can we do one more? Can we do one more? I think this is good that we're going to hit this next one. And it is prolonged or severe depression. Now, we have to understand that in this life, we have much tribulation. Tribulation can come in the form of moments, days, or maybe weeks of depression. But when we're talking about chronic, remember anything that becomes chronic, certainly you should begin to look for a spiritual application here. That something now is ruling you. You lose a loved one, you go through something big, certainly you're gonna be challenged and God's gonna see you through that. And if you're going through something now and you're feeling and, and feeling like there's some depression, that doesn't mean that there's some demon that's got you locked in that depression. You're going through something tragic and you're relying on the Lord to bring you through the other side. Who was it that said, when you're going through hell, keep on going? It's true, right? I don't wanna stay there. <laughs> but depression manifests as, listen, deep, long-lasting feelings of hopelessness. Isn't that terrible? that the enemy would give you deep, long, lasting feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, and despair. Friends, that is not of God. That is not God. That is everything but God. That is something working to destroy you. And this demonic spirit Remember, many of these things start out with an emotion that we inherently carry, but when left to ourselves, the enemy will come into that dark place and begin to move his dark spirits. And this darkness, depression, leads to emotional numbness. You ever seen somebody, they're just flat? They're not excited? I'm not talking about personalities are different, right? So remember, there's the line. But I'm saying someone has no emotions when it comes to things that are happy, things that are joyful. They're just numb. Because deep down inside, that spirit of depression has taken them over. When individuals feel disconnected from themselves, disconnected from others, disconnected from their loved ones, disconnected from their spouse. And if you're a believer, and we're talking to believers, disconnected from God. In most severe forms, depression can lead to thoughts of suicide. Depression will always accompany the spirit that lingers of suicide or a desire to escape life eternally. And all of a sudden you begin to hear the voice of the adversary that says, you know, you, you really should just end it because you're never gonna get better. You really should just jerk the wheel. You really should just get the, you know what? But people struggling with depression may feel a heavy burden that prevents them from finding any joy. And if they do find it, it's short-lived. 
any purpose, because purpose now is not more exciting and is not overpowering the depressive spirit. And they often wrestle with motivation for daily life. Depression can manifest not only as sadness, but as an overwhelming sense of emptiness or exhaustion. You ever have people that said they're just exhausted? And then you're like, well, what were you doing? They're like, I'm just exhausted. What were you doing? Well, I'm just exhausted. And in fact, guys, I saw a meme the other day. It says, no matter how exhausted you are, guaranteed your wife is more. That fell blank. Because the wife is always tired, more tired than you are. <laughs> All right, maybe it's just my household. We'll try it again next time. But depression has often signs of emotional numbness, a lack of emotional response, feeling detached from life, feeling as though nothing matters, joy and pleasure seem absent, and the individual feels emotionally flat. There's often a deep hopelessness, a persistent sense that life will not improve. This is what it is. It's never going to get better. And the person begins to speak things like this. So they speak what they feel. There's no reason to have hope. And this hopelessness can lead to despair and resignation. And often these individuals that are inflicted by this demonic spirit feel worthless, believing that they're unloved, believing that they're unwanted, believing that they have no value to others, and even that they have no value to God. They have nothing to offer. This can manifest as a constant internal dialogue of self-condemnation and guilt through the head. Thoughts of suicide that this person may contemplate ending their life or having to desire to escape the pain. This is a demonic spirit that afflicts major impact on its victim. Often feeling that death is the only solution to their suffering. They often feel fatigue and lethargy meaning that, remember, the spirit afflicts the emotions first and then the body. In the Old Testament, there's a spirit of slumber and there's a spirit of slumber in the New Testament. Two scriptures on the spirit of slumber. The spirit of slumber will often impact a person suffering with the spirit of depression. Either too much sleep or no sleep. If you can't ever sleep... Every person's going to have bad nights of sleep. But if you find yourself in patterns where you can't sleep or you can't wake up and it's continual, there is a spirit working against you. I feel triggers. I'm just sensing the spirit. I feel triggers. Isolation, a tendency to withdraw from friends a tendency to withdraw from family, a tendency to withdraw to all social interaction, choosing to be alone. That spirit drives you to isolation. I'm gonna contrast all the way on extreme, and I use this spirit often just to, to show you how prevalent this is. A spirit of homosexuality in a male wants to be seen and wants to be homo. <laughs> Maybe I should have picked a better word. I looked at John. <laughs> John. He just did this like this. <laughs> but that spirit is the opposite, right? It wants to be known. It wants to be flamboyant. And you notice that all the mannerisms are the same. Limp wrist, loose-lipped, right? They walk. You're seeing the spirit that's taking control of the body. So when you're dealing with the spirit of depression, you're going to get this. How are you doing? So the motions are all the same manifestations, meaning that whatever the spirit is, the person will manifest them when you begin to look for it. 
And so this spirit will drive the person to isolation. For an example, that homosexual spirit will drive the person to be seen. Every spirit has its ability to drive the person. Remember, it's a hook. Every spirit puts a hook. So it pulls in the direction it wants you to go. So prolonged or severe depression often signals demonic oppression that seeks to bind a person to emotional and spiritual darkness. The enemy, the devil, our adversary through his demonic force and realms uses depression as a tool to distort a person's identity and understanding God's love and purpose for them. Demons, evil spirits, whisper lies of, un, of worthlessness, lies of hopelessness, lies of isolation, leading individuals to believe that their life has no meaning and no value. Depression becomes an oppressive force that weighs down the mind, it weighs down the heart, and it weighs down the spirit. Depression is a weight. It weighs you down. Convincing the individual that they're beyond help and healing. Remember, you can't help me. I've tried. I've gone to a counselor. I've gone to the psychologist. I've gone to my pastor. And what you hear is a woe is me. De a depression, depressive spirit always has a woe is me. The spirit of heaviness is absolutely linked to the spirit of depression. A constant carry of heaviness. One thing about heaviness is if that person feels it, everybody around them is going to feel it. Remember when I talked about the spirit of anger? How I carried the spirit of anger, but I wasn't afraid? Excuse me, I carried the spirit of fear, but I wasn't afraid? but I made people afraid around me, i.e. my family. The spirit of heaviness, the person doesn't necessarily feel like they're heavy, but everyone around them feels heavy. You guys know what I'm talking about? Feeling triggers. The spirit feeds on despair. Remember, one, this principle, every spirit consumes something. Spirits consume emotions. That's how they eat and that's how they grow. When you give them the emotions, they grow. When you starve them, they lose power. They're parasites. Demons are parasites. They have to feed. They don't feed on food. They feed on emotions. Why do we take every thought captive unto Christ? Because the moment you believe that emotion, they're feeding, they're growing. The moment you reject it, now the war's on. Starting to click here, right? The power is here, the mind. This is where you will win and lose. So the spirit of heaviness, again, is linked to prolonged depression. The spirit feeds on despair convincing the person they are abandoned, <clears throat> convincing the person that they're alone, convincing the person that nobody cares about them, convincing the person that they're unable to recover from their pain. And the enemy uses this to disconnect the individual from God's truth. God has a truth. The enemy has lies. Which one do you believe? Do you believe the lies or do you believe the truth? And they are deeply, excuse me, the enemy uses this to disconnect the individual from God's truth. And the truth is that you are deeply loved and valuable in his sight. And that truth does not change. Truth has a funny way of always coming up with the same story. I believe I said this the other day. One thing about telling the truth is you never have to remember his story because truth always wins. 
And depression binds and blinds people to the reality of God's presence, leading them to isolation where they're mo more vulnerable to further spiritual attack. The worst thing for a person when they finally begin to get the revelation that there is a depressive spirit that is operating, working through them, is to continue to allow their same patterns before. We have to recognize patterns in our life. And I'll share one. You can reject it. You can be triggered by it. It's whatever. I love, and I've shared this before, when I sit, see what she's doing right there? I love doing this right here. Anybody ever do this? I could do it faster if I was sitting lower. Look, you stop now. She stops. So I have to constantly stop myself from doing little things that I know that the enemy may use to control my body. I'm not saying that's a demon. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the more involuntary responses that you allow your body or your emotions to do, the more propensity darkness has the ability to sneak in. We call them ticks. You have to take control over the things that you are allowing yourself to succumb to. If you don't like being around people, put yourself around people. If you don't like certain things, make yourself do it. Because what's behind is some emotion that controls you. And now you have no control over yourself. And you, you say, well, that's how I am. That emotion is ruling you. There's something behind it. Because now you can't even control yourself. And when all of a sudden the rubber hits the road, you find yourself exiting or you find yourself withdrawing and you, you, you can't stop yourself because you don't have control over it. Remember, when we started this course, we looked at that big list and I threw a curveball at you. Those, those are easy to see. We know they're demonic. These are much harder to see, but they're just as destructive. Spiritual oppression is what every, remember this is the last one, and I'm almost done. Spiritual oppression is what the enemy is after when it comes to depression. And the longer this depression persists, persists, and remember, it's not just depression, the longer any spirit persists in your life, it becomes a greater stronghold. That's why the greatest blessing is coming to this younger generation because, excuse me, they're already inundated with the greatest obstacles. The obstacles that came after us, Sophia, how old are you? 15, when we were 15, was far less. We still had all the same things, but now the, the more demonic you allow in your life, the more darkness there is to overcome it. Think of an army. If you have one intruder come in, you've got a problem. If you have one intruder come in and then two come in and then three come in and then four come in and then five come in and then 20 come in, not 40 come in, now 100 come in, now you've got, you, you are outnumbered. Now, can God do fuzzy math? If one of us can put a thousand to flight, but two of us can send? Was well, it one of us 10,000? What is it? I always forget the numbers. What's the, if one of us can send, it was a thousand to flight, right? Then two of us can send 10,000 or a legion? Ah, 10,000. Someone look at the scripture. But God's math is intended to drive out the ites. You ever let the ites in? They don't play fair. You crack that door open, baby, they coming in with a lot of ites. The Hittites and the Shittites, and the, is the Shittites one of them? <laughs> Lord, forgive me. It's Shittites or Hittites and Canaanites and the Iztites and the Miztites and the Pritites and the Parasites and all of the other ones. <laughs> they just bad. They're coming in. They're coming. <laughs> what is the scripture? It's 10,000. Okay. One of us can send 1,000 light to flight. Two of us can send 10,000 to flight. That's God's math. 
But you have to understand that the enemy does not play fair. So spiritual warfare, big thing. It's a, it's, here's the deal. Spiritual warfare is whether you live an abundant life, Christian life, or whether you just get through this life. Most Christians just get through this life. And the pastors lie when they do the funeral. The pastors lie when they do your funeral. Does that make sense to you? What I just said? It doesn't? I feel like I need to explain it. If the pastor is lying about their funeral, the pastor's saying, what an amazing man or woman of God you were when you weren't. You just got by. Is it a salvation issue? No. But you didn't overcome anything in your life. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm just saying this is how real the fight is. And we want to put people to sleep and entertain the people at church. And meanwhile, everything is falling apart in their life. And you ask me if there's a spiritual war. Because you can look around and have people come to the church and no doubt they love God, but they cannot overcome anything in their life. I'm not mad. I'm passionate. Does that make sense? Like you are called to be an overcomer. It, God does not give it to you. Did he make a way on the cross? Yes. Do you actually have to pick up your cross? Yes. Do you actually have to pick up the sword? Yes. Do you have to put on the armor of God? Yes. Do you have to learn how to battle the ites? Absolutely. They're still here. They're cunning. They're clever. They don't play fair. They're parasitical. They get in. They devour. They want to consume your emotions. They want to rob your joy. They want to steal your covenant. They want to steal your promise. They want to siphon off your anointing. They are takers. This stuff, it, guys, this stuff is real. It doesn't matter if you don't believe it. The people that don't believe it, they are not, not only are they not effective in their own households, they are nothing in the kingdom of God. I'm not saying they're not love. They, they have no purpose in the kingdom of God. They get rolled over by the enemy because they want to deny he even exists. I said, what about all the uh, demonic stuff? The enemy doesn't hide anything now. He hides nothing, nothing. It's on your TV. It's on the internet. It's demonic. It's dark. It's down the street. Halloween, you don't even have to look around. You go through. It's so much darkness. And we're, oh yeah, they, this light, they like this for some reason. Now I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> depression distorts the way a person sees themselves and a depression certainly destroys the way the person sees of themselves in the future. And the enemy uses depression to strip away a person's sense of worth, leading them to believe they are burdened or that their life has no purpose. The lie drives them deeper into darkness, away from the truth, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And all of this always culminates, depression will culminate to get to the next link in the chain. And that link in the chain is suicide. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He has to get rid of you. And the way the enemy works is always a slow kill process to defeat you, discourage you, defeat you, discourage you, defeat you, discourage you, till you finally say, I give up. And one of the most dangerous effects of prolonged depression when not understanding that you must break this, not because of your works, you must allocate the promise God has given to you. You can't defeat these spirits with your own power, not one bit. It's allocating the power that God has given to you from on high that this will lead to suicidal thoughts and obviously, ultimately, if he can, suicide in of itself. And I believe most of the people in this room know someone that's taken their life and it's the most tragic and devastating thing, not just for you as a person, but the family that has to pick up the pieces. It is absolutely demonic at its core and tragic at every level. And who does that sound like? The enemy, the devil, the adversary. 
The enemy seeks to convince individuals that death is the only way out of suffering, but this is not only a lie that affects the individual, it's a lie that will affect everybody around the individual, and it will be a generational curse that's released that you must break free from. Jesus offers freedom. Jesus offers healing. Jesus offers life. So, in a recap, before we pray, common spiritual strongholds linked to depression, the spirit of heaviness, we talked about that. The spirit of rejection, we've talked about that. The spirit of fear, we've talked about that. And remember, generational curses. Because dad himself, all of a sudden, there's the lingering spirit. Break that thing tonight. Break it over your house, break it over your mind, break it over your children, break it over your offspring, break it over your legacy. Root causes, in closing, and we're gonna pray. Unhealed emotional wounds. So there's depression, why? There was a wound somewhere that's not been healed. Depression stems from unresolved trauma. Somewhere, something got in. It hurts you. What are you going to do with it now? You got hurt. Are you going to let God heal you or are you going to let it get all the way to the end? Somewhere you were rejected. Somewhere you had loss. When emotional wounds are left unhealed, the enemy uses them as a foothold to bring depression and despair. Wounds have to be taken to God every time. He is your physician. Oh, Lord, heal my body. No, 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 no. Heal this thing. Your body's going to heal. You realize if you do nothing to the extent of your physical trauma, right? You cut yourself, you break a bone, the body has already been designed to start healing. This thing, you can either try to heal it or you can let the physician heal it. Those are your two options. And if you try to heal it, you will not be able to. It will turn into bitterness. It will turn into hatred. It will turn into all types of other infirmities that you'll experience in your life. Another root cause is spiritual disconnect. Depression can create a disconnect from God's truth and his presence. The enemy's goal is to keep individuals in darkness, believing that God is distant, believing that God is, is, does not know their pain, believing that God does not exist in their reality. And God is always near, listen to the brokenhearted. It's okay to be brokenhearted, but just understand that you need to cry out to God. Cry out to God and he's near to you. And finally, when there is this type of demonic oppression, remember that demons feed, as I spoke before, off individuals, emotions. And the enemy feeds lies that you are unloved and that you're beyond help. You're not beyond help. If you hear my voice, you're not beyond help. God is here now. And when we believe these lies, a person can be trapped in their depression, making them feel disconnected, not just from God, but from all the other people that love them. Right now, no matter who you are, there are a score of people that love you, well beyond what I can love you. There are people in your life that you mean the world to. There are people in your life that when they think of you, nobody in this life do they love more than you. There are people in your life that would do anything for you. And what depression does is it makes you reverse every one of those thoughts to get you to believe that nobody cares and nobody loves you. And that is a lie. That is a lie. I'm about to pray. If this is you, I just ask that you begin to seek the Lord. If this is you, I just ask that you begin to ask the Lord, where is the hang up? If this is not for you, but it's someone in your life that you know, I ask that you begin to intercede for them as I get some music on. And then when I'm done, 
I'm just going to keep praying. It's 821, so we didn't do too bad. And probably what I'm going to do is when I begin to pray, at any point, I'll probably pray for a while that is beyond just depression. I don't know if I'll pray for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? I don't know. Um, but at any point, you're free to go or you're free to sit here and to pray. But I'm going to begin to just pray as the Spirit leads. I'm going to focus first on this wicked, evil stronghold. And I will not formally dismiss you after that. If you feel like leaving, you can. If you feel like staying, please do so. But if you're staying, I just ask that you would stay in the spirit and understand that these are real things. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We come before you on behalf of every person, friend, loved one, brother, sister, mom or dad, nephew, niece, sons and grandsons, daughters and granddaughters. Every person that has succumbed not because they wanted to, but because of the unfair yoke of the enemy that has come to steal, kill, and destroy, to take their joy, to take their life, to take their ambition, to take their peace. Lord, and we thank you that you came to give life and that more abundantly. And we thank you, Lord, that you are, are near to the brokenhearted. And Father, I cannot think of anyone more brokenhearted that has been consumed by prolonged severe depression, this wicked stronghold, this wicked spirit, this wicked foul principality that has come to release despair upon this earth. Father, I ask that today that you would bring our hearts and minds before you. Lord, as we seek your healing and we just seek your deliverance, from this deep darkness of depression that has weighed down the body of Christ, that has weighed down sons and daughters, that has weighed down believers, that has weighed down saints of God from generations past. We know, Father, that you've not created your sons and daughters to live in despair, but to walk in your peace, to walk in your joy, to walk in the abundance of hope. But Lord, we confess and repent for beliefs and thoughts and actions that have opened doors to heaviness in this life. In areas that we've agreed with darkness, we've agreed with bitterness, we've agreed with sin, we've agreed, Lord, with the enemy. And we repent for every lie that we've believed about ourselves, every lie that we believed about the adversary that we came into agreement with the kingdom of darkness. And Father, we repent for every area that we believe that we're unworthy. We believe that we're unloved. We believe that we're hopeless. And we renounce these lies. We renounce them over ourselves. We renounce them over our bloodline that we are not unworthy, we're not unloved, and we're not hopeless. And we choose to believe truth over lies, that we're fearfully and wonderfully, uh, wonderfully made according to your Psalms 139, that you have a plan and a purpose for our life according to Jeremiah. 
And in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Deliverer, our Healer, our Savior, we rebuke and command the spirit of heaviness to leave, uproot, and we renounce every spirit of depression, strongholds, every ruling spirit, every spirit that came in in waves, in times where the life and soul have been open to trauma, where the life and the soul have been open to hurt, where the life and the soul have been open because of something that happened, we renounce the enemy. Every spirit of despair that came in, every horde that came in, rooted on the stronghold of depression, we renounce. Every spirit that's draw, that has drawn us to isolate, that has kept us bound in chains of darkness. You have no place in my mind. Say that right now. You have no place in my mind. Say it again. You have no place in my mind. You will no longer take up real estate. You will no longer take up the host. And we break your hold. Think of that right now. Think of the enemy being broken right now. Think of his foundations, his walls. Think of his cities. Think of the strongholds. The enemy has built up walls. The enemy did that. He built up walls. Begin to see them come down brick by brick by brick by brick by brick. Coming down like the Lord is coming in. He's coming in right now. He's coming in. He's the breaker. That's the breaker of the anointing. The breaker of the anointing coming in. Breaking walls. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, move, 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 move. See the enemy coming in. The enemy routing. The enemy routing. The enemy routing. The enemy routing. We break your hold. We break your hold over the mind. We break your hold. And we confess the blood of Jesus and declare that we are set free by the power and his grace and we appropriate the power that he's given us from above and we appropriate the power that he's releasing now. We appropriate the power that he's coming to bring the captives free. We cast out every demonic influence that has sought to bring us into emotional and spiritual bondage and we break your hold. Walk out of your prison cell. Walk out of your prison cell. Walk out and be freed. We break the spirit of rejection. We break the spirit of worthlessness. We break it in the mighty name of Yeshua, Jesus. You are the king. You have the authority. You have the power. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that every work of darkness shall not prevail. Every work of darkness shall not control. Every work of darkness shall not rule my being, but I shall be ruled by the Spirit of the living God. I declare that I am accepted in the beloved. I declare my worth comes from you alone. I will not believe the lies of the enemy that say I'm unwanted or unloved. I reject every feeling. I rejected every thought. I rejected every word spoken through the mouth of darkness, through the mouth of the slithering serpent, that I am loved and embraced and accepted in the beloved. I am a child of God. Say that. Chosen. Say it. Called by your name. And nothing can separate me from his love. Lord, I take authority over the thoughts that have plagued my mind. Remember, if these words speak, take them to yourself. Just come into agreement with my words. We take authority over the thoughts that have plagued my mind. The thoughts of suicide or self-harm, we break in the mighty name of Jesus. Lose its power. 
I command suicide and every working spirit that comes in conjunction with the kingdom of darkness to begin to be uprooted and loose from your being. Right now that every spirit that came in in those times of hopelessness begins to be uprooted and be routed out of your physical being and your mind. I command it to come out of every natural path and process within your person, within your soul, and make your way out of the natural breath and leave this chamber and leave the temple of God and leave and to go out to where the Lord Jesus Christ sends you. We proclaim the love of God and we will not believe the lies of the enemy. And we take authority over these thoughts. And I declare now that you will live. And you will not die. Say that. I will live and I will not die. Say it again. You will live. You will live an abundant life of Jesus Christ. You will live and you will prosper. You will live and you will make it. You will live and you will be a blessing. You will live and you will contribute. You will live and you will rule. You will live and you'll take authority. You will live. God has made you the head and not the tail. You will live and you will rule with the kingdom of God upon this earth. You will not die. We renounce every spirit of death and destruction and we speak life over this house. We speak life over the ones watching. We speak life over the ones listening. We speak the life of Yeshua. The life is in the blood and we plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you came to destroy the works of the devil and we trust in your power to heal and restore our minds completely. Think that right now. The Lord's restoring. The Lord's healing right now. Dealing with wounds. Dealing with healing. Emotional hurts, heartaches. He's doing it right now. Doing what man cannot do. Doing what medicine cannot do. He is the great physician tending to the soul. And Father, we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Ask right now that the Father fills you with his Holy Spirit. Ask him. Feel me. Feel me. Every dark place, every place you've not let him in before, ask him that he fills you. Every place that was void, every place that was dark, every place that was hidden, every place that he's not gone before, the doors you closed and you forgot about. I pray right now that the Father fills you, that the Holy Spirit fills you, that he replaces every dark place in your heart with light. Every dark place in your heart with peace. Every dark place in your heart with joy. That the curse shall be reversed. We ask that you give us garments of praise instead of spirit of heaviness. We ask that you lift our eyes unto you. That we'd find hope in your word and see the future. And ask the Father right now to renew your mind. Help me to think on what is true. What is noble? What is right? Resist the urge of regurgitating the enemy's lies, the enemy's voice. Do the opposite of what the enemy is compelling you to do. And resist. And he'll flee. We declare that there's freedom from depression tonight. Freedom from fear tonight. Freedom from hopelessness tonight that you choose to walk in victory that Jesus has won for you and I that we trust you to guide our steps to step into wholeness that your joy may be full and your peace surpasses understanding that you may guard our hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And Father, we thank you for hearing our cry. We thank you for being near. We thank you for delivering us from troubles. And we praise you for the freedom and healing you are bringing into my life. Thank him right now. Thank him. And we commit to trusting you each day, knowing that you are our refuge and our strength in the mighty name of of Jesus Christ. 
That concludes this, the prayer over depression. Again, if you have to go, please, please feel free. I'm going to continue to pray for some other things. As the Spirit gives me utterance, I understand it's a school night. Don't even think twice about leaving, but I'm going to be praying for another five, ten minutes. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for bringing us in right relationship. Lord, with friends, Lord, that sticks closer than a brother. And Lord, we know that our greatest friend, our greatest ally is our Lord Jesus Christ, a friend that never leaves us and never forsakes us. Father, I pray right now that everyone under the sound of my voice would understand that they have a friend. Every one of us would understand that when you are our greatest friend, that we'll never thirst again, that we'll never be in need again. I thank you, God, for putting together godly friendships in our lives, friends that challenge us and lift us up, friends that encourage us, friends that pray for us, friends that are godly, of good character, friends that point us to you, friends that lift us up in times of need, friends that take up the hedge in times of trouble, friends that will delight in the ways of the Lord. I thank you for cultivating friendships within this church that are of godly character, that will love and support. And Father, I thank you right now for a purging of friendships that are not godly, friends that tear us down, friends that back, backbite, friends that lead us into temptation. Father, by your Holy Spirit, lead us into places and paths of light. Remove us from ungodly soul ties, past relationships, past partners, exes. Break soul ties of ungodly friendships. Break soul ties of ungodly men and women that had had influence and have influence over our lives. Break ungodly work relationships. Break ungodly soul ties within even families, between mothers and fathers, Break ungodly ties that have kept us in darkness, kept us in fear, kept us in bondage. Break those ties now. Reveal them. Father, I pray that you would begin to carve new desires that are godly, new desires that are holy, new desires that are righteous, new desires that are pure, and purge ungodliness, purge our old man, purge, Father. We thank you that it was done on the cross, but Lord, that we may appropriate these things in our life for this hour. Father, I pray that you would take shame and guilt. Father, I pray that you would take the lies of the enemy, the deception of the enemy, the confusion of the enemy. Father, take them and purge them from our minds. Purge them from our character. Purge them, Lord, that we may see clearly the way that you see. Father, that we would forgive and forget and move forward. Father, that you would heal. Every spirit that has kept us in the past, kept us from moving forward, kept us from moving into your plans and your future, break those ties now that we may live in today and what you have for us today. Father, we break every tie, Lord, that is connected to this world. We break every tie that's connected to darkness. We break every agreement that we've had in darkness. Known and unknown, show it to us. Show it to us, mighty God. Show us where we have agreed with darkness. 
that we may renounce it, confess it, and repent of it. Renounce it, confess it, repent of it. We don't want that. Lord, you're so good. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for paths of righteousness, deep neuro pathways being formed within our psyche, being formed within our spirit, being formed within our character. Take evil from us, words on our mouth, thoughts in our heart. Take it. We release it. Take it. Teach us long suffering. Teach us long suffering. Teach us selflessness. Teach us perseverance. Teach us loving kindness. Teach us how to be righteous and pure and noble and true and kind. Teach us, mighty God. Teach us. Teach us not how to hold on to wrongdoings. Teach us how to let go of bitterness. Teach us how to let go of rejection. Teach us how to let go of despair. Teach us, mighty God. Teach us. Teach us how to love in the fire. Teach us, Lord, how to move forward another day. Teach us how to not grow cold and hard. Break up the fallow soil. Break up the hardened heart. Break our hearts for you. Make our hearts soft. Make our minds pure. Make our affections loyal and true and honest and steadfast. Teach us to follow you. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to honor you. Teach us to fear you, mighty God. Teach us to be us and nobody else. Teach us how to be us with no influence from outside forces, no copycats, no duplicates, but just you. Teach us how to be us. Teach us how to be us, whoever that is, that we're okay with it. Teach us, Lord, to be okay with ourselves. I'm talking about the personality. I'm talking about who God made you in the purified form of you. That's what I mean. We don't have to copy. We don't have to mimic. We don't have to duplicate. And refine us in the fires. Put us in the streams. Put us in the waters that you wash us in your word. Teach us to love your word. Teach us to search your word. Teach us to trust your word. Teach us to live by your word. Let us let go of wrongdoing. Let us let go of hardships. Let us let go of failures. Let us let go of things in our life that stunted us, that hurt us, that broke us. Let there be freedom tonight. Let there be hope tonight. Let there be a release tonight. And every prong of darkness that has bitten, that has stung, every scorpion that released his stinger and every bite of the serpent that has released its venom. We confess the blood of Christ to transfuse our being, to rout out death, and to infuse life. Teach us to love. Teach us to love, a deeper love, a genuine love, a right love. Teach us strength, teach us honor, teach us wisdom, teach us truth. Teach us to bridle our tongue, to bridle our thoughts. 
Teach us honor and purity and purity of heart, purity of mind, purity of actions. Release us from any deep-rooted hate, deep-rooted envy, deep-rooted bitterness. Purge it from our veins. Purge it from the roots of the depths of our spiritual being. Purge us, O oh God. Purge sickness from our flesh. Purge sickness from our hearts. Purge sickness from our genes. Purge it. Purge it, purge it, purge it. All darkness being released from your mind. Perversion being released from your mind, from your members. Infuse us with passion. Infuse us, infuse us with passion for God. Passion for our Lord. Passion for the lost. Passion for those that are bound patience and loving kindness. Teach us patience, mighty God. Teach us love for those that are unlovable. Teach us love for those that are outcasts. Teach us love for those that are hurting and broken and tired and bruised and teach us love. Teach us the love that covers a multitude of sins. Teach us the love that covers a multitude of hardness, a multitude of wickedness. Take the heavy burden of this life from us tonight. Change our outlook on things. Change our mind Infuse deep into our person peace that surpasses the understanding of this human life experience. Teach us the peace of God, shalom, the mighty name of Israel. Teach us the peace of God that transfuses every argument and vain imagination. Teach us how to walk in peace amongst the chaos. Teach us how to guard and protect your peace. Infuse us with light in every area of our life. May your light shine into every dark place. May our feet be like burning brass, brass. As we walk into the highways and the byways of life, into our workplaces and our homes, may fire be released from our feet. as we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let us take up the armor of God as we put on the belt of truth, as we walk in truth and not lies. We walk in truth and defined by truth. As you said, thy word is truth. We put on the shield of faith to extinguish every fiery dart of the enemy. the shield of faith and the breastplate of righteousness as we take up the shield of faith and put on, excuse me, the breastplate of righteousness that our life is defined by righteousness within us, covering the heart that's been purified by the blood of Jesus, the pure and spotless lamb. Lord, as our head is covered our mind has taken upon salvation of the helmet of salvation and we put that helmet upon our head as we take on the mind of Christ, as we have taken on the spirit of life, that we have not been given the spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind, that our mind is now that of the lamb. the helmet of salvation. That we find refuge and strength in our eternal security. 
that we're not outcasts, that we're not bastards, but we are accepted in the beloved. We have purpose. We have identity. We are rooted and strengthened by the vine, by the tree of life. Lord, in the left hand, we take up that shield of faith, as I said earlier, to extinguish every fiery dart of lies and deception and wickedness and temptation and every other lie that the enemy uses to shoot into our camp, to shoot against you. May we take refuge behind the shield. And when the enemy comes, may we trust the shield. May we trust its duty to protect us and extinguish the fiery lies, the words, the accusations, the words spoken in hate, the words spoken in turmoil, the words spoken in fear, that we may extinguish them. They shall not reach the chest. They shall not reach the heart, but they shall only reach the shield that extinguishes the fiery darts and the lies of the enemy. And Father, may we learn to take up the sword of the Spirit the two-mouthed sword, the double-edged sword. May we take up the word of God and understand that our weapon is mighty and powerful, rightfully dividing truth and lies, soul and spirit. It's the mouth of God and the mouth of man. As you put the word in us, as you promised that you sent your word to heal our disease, that you are the healer. Jehovah Rapha, my God who heals. May we take up the sword and take on the offense to charge into the enemy's camp and plunder and take back what the enemy has stolen. Every year, every decade that the enemy has stolen, may we take back May we take it all back and demand the restitution that God has promised that there shall be a sevenfold return on all that the enemy has taken through the canker worm and through the caterpillar, through the droughts and the famines, through the outcast and through the failures of life that the enemy will repay. The enemy will repay. And God will bless you with what he has promised to give you. And we stand on the word of God that we will not lose and we will not fail and we will not give anything to the enemy. But we will take it all back. We will take our families back. We will take our children and wives back, our husbands back. We will take all of he of which has taken from us and we will take it back and demand that there will be a sevenfold blessing and we will plunder the enemy's camp. And Lord, we declare finally tonight that we are the offspring. We are the offspring of the tribe of Judah. We are your children. And we are accepted in the beloved. May we place our love and affection, our allegiance on you. May we remove all confidence from ourselves. And may we find no confidence in ourselves, zero that we will find all of our confidence in the power of your Holy Spirit to protect us, to guide us, to lead us into paths of righteousness. We take off all assurance in of ourselves and we reject any confidence in this flesh put no confidence in your flesh. But we put our allegiance and our trust in you. 
And I pray, Father, as that those have gone and those that will go shortly, that they would be full of the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. Not full of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. That their spirit would make intercession, that their hearts would be full and their lives would be full of expectation of what you're about to do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.